uh, Michael Gelfond. I'd like to thank people for inviting me here. Uh, after listening to these talks, I even more wish I were a former student of uh, Judea. <laughs> uh, but no such luck. I've met Judea at some conferences, talked with him. To my great surprise, I still remember vividly every talk I had with him, even though they were very small, mostly. But I was much more influenced by attempting to read his books. So what I'm going to talk about is really a result of reading his book on causality and trying to understand the notion of intervention, which impressed me greatly. I don't really remember an idea which in the last 30 years which impressed me that much. Uh, so uh, the goal is combining probabilistic and logical reasoning. Uh, I'm a logician by training, and I'm interested in understanding common sense reasoning. Uh, in some way, I view probability as an attempt to formalize common sense reasoning when people are interested about degrees of beliefs. On the other hand, when I was in school, I understood probability as a part of measure theory. And it was great, but it was all about mathematics and had nothing to do with any type of applications. And when they taught us statistics, I was completely lost. And so for a very long time, I was in this strange mode of complete disconnect here. And reading Judea's books really helped me to understand what's going on. Certainly won't be able to do it without. So here is a goal. Oh, and it's a joint work with Chita Baral and Nelson Rushton. So our goal was to find a knowledge representation language, allowing natural elaboration tolerant representation of common sense knowledge involving logic and probability. Elaboration tolerant means small changes in informal representation cause only small changes in the formula. I'm not going to talk about why we wanted to do it, but I would like to mention a couple of criteria of success. It's an incomplete list. Well, first of all, we wanted to look at a number of non-trivial combinations of logical and probabilistic reasoning. Simple but non-trivial. And see if you can elegantly represent it in our language and reason with it. Second, probably most important for me, I want you to really understand probability. And I was trying to see what combining it with logic can help me. And finally, we wanted our language to help us to design and implement knowledge-based software system. So there was some practical aspect of it. So first of all, we had to select the logic. It wasn't difficult for us because two of the authors worked on so-called answer set programming. And answer set programming uh, is a non-monotonic logic with a high degree of elaboration tolerance. In some way, it is similar to writer's default logic. It is capable of representing and reasoning with defaults, causal relations, recursive definitions, various forms of incomplete information, and so on. It has some reasonably well understood methodology of use and fairly efficient inference agents. And now it has a fairly large number of applications. So selected probabilistic model was more difficult. Uh, but after reading uh, uh, 88 book of Judea, uh, I realized that I really would like to view probability as measure of degree of belief. And it was a very natural match because uh, answer set programming and answer set logic is about beliefs. And you may have beliefs in P, you can believe P, you can disbelieve P, or you can remain undecided. You would like to have more degrees of beliefs you need more subtle numerical values. And so after reading book on causality, I understood what we wanted was causal Bayesian nets. You either read a little bit more at a time, 
I probably would come with uh, structural equations. But we didn't read long enough before we started to work on that. <coughs> so I'm not going to be able to, of course, present the language, but I would like to be able to give an example. So as an example, I'm going to talk about Monty Hall problem represented in our language, which is called PILOG. Most of you probably know the problem, but just in case, uh, Monty is a TV show host, and he invites a guest, a player, to his studio, and there are three doors. There's a prize uh, behind one of the doors, and uh, a player selects one of the doors. And after that, Monty is obligated to open one of the remaining doors, which does not contain the prize. After this is done, a player is given a, a chance to change his selection. And the question is, does it matter if the player switches? And a lot of people I know, including myself, if forced to answer kind of immediately, give a wrong answer. My immediate answer, and I will say, you better answer right now. Uh, uh, my immediate answer was, no, it doesn't matter. There's an obvious argument behind it. Uh, so in some way, it's a subtle problem and though simple. The difficulty, of course, is, is to select the proper probabilistic model. And this language is supposed to help us to do exactly that. So here are the game's rules in PILOG. We have three random attributes or random variables, if you prefer, called select, prize, and open. And they take the values from doors. One, two, three stand for the doors. Now, after that, we have a definition of relation can open. And this relation is given in the language of answer set program. It's a logic program, basically. It says, if do D is selected, it cannot be open. If price is behind door D, it cannot be open. And otherwise, it can be open. There are two negations here. So those of you who do not know uh, anything about default logic or answer set programming, you can use, this is a classical negation, roughly speaking. And this is negation as failure or default negation, a non-monotonic uh, logical construct. Uh, after that, we are assuming that price and selection are done at random, and any one of three doors can be selected. And uh, open is also a random process. But Monty can open a door which he can open. Okay. So this last statement is, Selection of the value of open occurs at random from the set of all doors which can be opened. That's a whole program. So after that, what you can do you consider a scenario in which, say, a player selected door one. Monty open door two, and price is not behind door two. And then the compute probability defined by this program. And in the first case, probability is one third, and the second one is two thirds, it's done automatically. Therefore, it's a good idea to switch. How much time do I have left? OK, great. So I probably can go back and say something at least a little bit technical. Uh, there is semantics of PILOG. And it's important to redefine semantics to explain how probability is given by this program. So there are three steps in defining this semantics. First, we take program in PILOG and translate it into program of answer set PROLOG, denoted by tau of p. Now tau of p has models, which are called answer sets. They represent possible beliefs of an agent. Okay. So these 
answer sets are viewed as possible worlds of your original program pi. And after that, we have to assign probability measure to each possible world, and you are done. Here, we don't have any specific probabilistic information. So we're using difference principle and assume that everything is equally likely. And that's how you're going to get our answer. Uh, of course, in some cases, uh, it's maybe not equally likely. If you learn it, a given choice between opening doors two and three, Monty opens door two more frequently. You can express it by this statement right here. And this is really a causal probability. It's kind of a very small part of a causal Bayesian net. In general, you have these rules I described. You define what is random. And you add, if you have this information, causal Bayesian net, which helps us to assign probability according to what these rules say. Uh, I'm going to skip uh, a couple of other things here. And I attempt to explain uh, first what are distinctive features of PILOG, how it differs from other logic based languages we are aware of. Uh, well, first of all, what was important for me, at least, and I believe for other authors, the log probabilities were defined with respect to explicitly stated knowledge base. What always bothered me in classical approach, that the only way to update your knowledge base is to do conditional probability. And the basic theory is kind of hidden. It's not present in there. The second difference, and of course, a lot of systems have this property. The second difference is our logic is non-monotonic. But also, our, our program is probabilistically non-monotonic, which means the following. When we attempt to condition on observations, what happens, some of our possible worlds disappear. But no possible worlds, no new possible worlds appear as a result of such update. Here we can update in a way which would allow us to introduce new possible worlds, which means you can model change from one probability model to another probability model. And that's something we wanted to really capture. Uh, finally, we didn't lack the fact that in standard probabilistic approach, you not only uh, condition on observations only, these observations are formulas of certain sort. They should be in the same language. They cannot be rules. They cannot be defaults, and so on. So in this approach, you have very natural possible updates, kind of automatically included in our semantics. Whatever can be added to your program can be uh, conditioned upon. So our possible updates include defaults, Rules introducing new terms so you can go outside of the language, original one. Uh, and most importantly for me, uh, we can condition on deliberate actions. So you can have uh, kind of calculus of interventions built in in this language. Uh, it certainly was uh, inspired by reading causality, uh, but uh, Mathematically, very different formalism is used here. Basically, non-monotonic negation is failure, is used to deal with it. And uh, uh, finally, conclusion. So I mentioned several things we wanted to test our theories upon. So we did test it on a comparatively large number by now of uh, uh, non-trivial examples. Part of this game, of course, is to learn how to program or how to represent knowledge in a new language. And in my judgment, it's really part of design of the language. Otherwise, language is good for nothing. And the results so far are satisfying. 
Now, I also learned a lot about probability from this exercise. We're very happy that we can do interventions, for instance, nicely. And we started to use PLOG for design and implementation of real software system. So we had a software system built in answers at PROLOG, which was actually a real system, uh, which was aimed as, as software support for uh, uh, shuttle controllers. Okay. And they did a lot of planning and a lot of diagnostics. People are not interested in it anymore because they're not interested in shuttles. <laughs> But you had this fairly powerful, non-trivial system. And we were looking for diagnosis which were defined with some preferences as, as good or best or whatever. But actually, there was some probabilistic information available about how frequently different components of a system fail. And so we wanted to represent this information using our PLOG. OK, I'm, I'm done. And uh, we succeeded. But it's completely clear that we need to have much more sophisticated reasoning methods. We really have to explore in forms of graphs and so on. Thank you.